Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yijun. I'm from Georgia Tech. I'm going to present our paper titled Practical Attacks Against Grab-Based Clustering. This is joint work with my colleagues, Yasin Thanos, collaborators Fabian, Roberto, Nick, and my advisor, Manos. Many researchers have demonstrated how to evade machine learning classifiers by crafting adversarial examples. For instance, by putting stickers on a physical stop sign, um, the classifier can think the stop sign is a speed limit sign. By injecting invisible perturbations onto a cat image, the classifier can mistake the cat as an oil filter. Similarly, we can trick the classifier to think the PDF malware or spam emails are in fact benign by modifying metadata and content to change how they enhance benign features and reduce malicious features. Now, the majority of related work focused on adversarial analysis of classification. What about clustering? Many secure data sets can be represented as graphs. By applying techniques such as community detection, spectral clustering, and hierarchical clustering, we can identify criminal network hosting infrastructure, detect malware downloading events, and discover malware families. In addition, newly devised graph embedding techniques can further improve upon the state of the art and help us build even more powerful security applications. Um, clustering is also often used as a first line of defense to, to detect new streams of attacks before any labels are available. Therefore, it is really important. However, limited attention has been paid to adversarial clustering analysis. In this paper, we present the first practical attempt to attack graph-based modeling techniques. Specifically, we propose two novel yet simple attacks. By conducting such attacks and doing um, cost analysis, so it helps us identify the weaknesses of a clustering system, and therefore we can propose defenses to improve the robustness of a clustering system. Our attacks are based on the following intuition. The attacker starts with her nodes being clustered together, like following. She can either try to inject noise into the existing cluster, and the attack will be successful if uh, the noisy cluster after noisy injection will be predicted with the wrong label by a following classifier. Or she can try to separate her nodes um, so that these nodes no longer cluster together. This creates islands in graph partition based clustering schemes. And the nodes will join other noisy clusters if the clustering is based on graph embeddings. We, infor we um, require that the attack will be successful if all such clusters are predicted with the wrong label by a following classifier. In reality, how can attackers separate the nodes? Let's look at the case of domain name generation algorithms, or DGAs. DGAs are often used by bomb masters to generate domain names dynamically in order to do command control. The algorithm is either embedded in the malware, or it could be running on the server, then a new daily config file containing a list of newly generated domain will be pushed to the malware. In fact, the hosts curate uh, a list of DGA domains, and this constructs a bipartite graph between hosts on the one side and domain nodes on the other side. The edges will connect them, representing the query relationship. By clustering a graph of all hosts curing an X domains, we can find uh, DGA malware families. Now, as the specific adversarial example to evade clustering, if for the sample box malware family, um, those DGA domains are clustered together because of the common infected hosts curing them, the attacker can try to separate these domains into distinct clusters by running a server-side DGA instead. The server-side DGA can push a different domain for a different infected host. Therefore, these domains can no longer be clustered together, and they, this creates islands. However, in this specific example, maybe the cost of the attack is too high. In order for this to work, the bomb master will need to register a distinct domain for each infected host. In addition, um, it's also easier for defenders to sinkhole the domains and take over the entire botnet um, if the bomb master give up the redundancy of having multiple DGA domains. In reality, the size of the islands can be even bigger, depending on the clustering system hyperparameters. Now, in order to figure out the details of what specific 
configurations to do for injecting noise and also separate the islands. We conducted our experiments on a state-of-the-art DJ detection system called Pleiades. Pleiades has a graph modeling component. The system takes um, the bipartite graph between hosts and NX domains they curate as input. And then it does a variety of different levels of clustering. So we extended um, beyond the original system and added community detection, spectral clustering, and no 2 vac as the clustering techniques to evaluate the attacks. And after we have the clusters, we will extract features from uh, a one feature vector from each cluster. And then we'll classify uh, different clusters as either new DGML families or they will probably look benign. Our re-implementation re used real-world telecommunication data. We achieved a high accuracy and low false positive rate, and we discovered 12 new DGA families. In order to do adversarial clustering analysis, we faced several challenges. First, clustering needs global features. And to understand what we mean by global features, let's look at traditional features often used by classifiers. Those features are local because they can be extracted as from pixels on an image, words in a spam email, or metadata or content from PDF itself. It only requires one object that is being classified. However, in order to do clustering, we have to know all the objects being clustered in order to determine what is the final set of clusters generated. Sometimes when people build uh, class classifiers, uh, they also use more global features such as uh, historical IPs re resolved by a domaining, even if at the time of classification, the domain doesn't resolve into certain IPs. Um, this makes the feature more global because time increases this um, correlation on the graph. As an attacker, she um, often only sees her local graph from the global graph. Therefore, this motivates our need to have different levels of attacker capabilities as a threat model. In addition to the challenge of having global features, Clustering systems often have a variety of hyperparameters. In spectral clustering, there's the rank in SVD that a defender needs to tune. And in no 2 vac there are a variety of hyperparameters related to random walk sampling. And due to those challenges, we propose the following threat model. There is a global graph curly G that the defender wants to cluster. And within the global graph, attacker sees a local graph G belonging to the curly graph G. And this attacker graph is a bipartite graph. The attacker's goal is to answer the following question. How can she change G to G prime to evade clustering? There are three different types of attackers, minimal, moderate, and perfect knowledge. The minimal knowledge attacker has access to only the local graph G and whatever open source intelligence data set that is available online. That includes public blacklists or any open um, data set. In our experiment, we used 395,000 reverse engineered DGA domains from 14 malware families. Um, these algorithms are obtained from a public GitHub repo. Next level, the modern knowledge attacker has access to not only whatever minimal knowledge attacker has, but also another curly graph um, the global graph G prime from a surrogate network. So this is a very realistic assumption because it is so easy for any bad guy having to have access to a sp small botnet, compromise uh, an enterprise network, or part, even part of a campus network. Having access to the surrogate network, the attacker can run the attacks and then test using the surrogate network data set and see if the attack succeeds. And then um, the results can be reapplied to the original network. So in our experiments, we use one day of university network traffic as the surrogate network data set. Lastly, the perfect knowledge attacker has access to everything. Not only the original global graph curly G, but also all the related clustering uh, system hyperparameters that can help the attacker reliably recompute the final set of cluster with different configurations of the attack. In our experiments, we use 12 days of telecommunication data as uh, the original global graph curly G. Now our first targeted noise injection attack improves upon prior work. Instead of randomly inject noise into the global graph, we inject noise in a targeted way. 
We call that the attacker's goal is to make additional nodes to join the same cluster the attacker has control of. The attacker starts with this bipartite graph again with hosts on one side, curing domains on the other side. And then the injected noise, noisy nodes will need to join the same, either the same graph partition or these additional nodes will should have the same node embeddings. The attacker first choose the set of additional nodes to add. And according to her knowledge, those nodes vary. And then the attacker mirrors the edges from E to E prime. Um, that, this results to G prime consists of U, a combination of V and V prime, a combination of E and E prime. This will be the graph after the attack. In practice, choices of V prime depends on attacker's knowledge. We require that V prime should be very different from V, such that after all nodes from V and V prime appear in the same cluster, that will be evaluated um, as a different label by a following classifier. Our results show that this noise injection is effective against all three clustering methods we evaluated. Um, as a defense, we propose that we can retrain noisy clusters in order to make the classifier more robust against noise. This has the limitation of we have to see the, the type of noise first, then retraining can defend against the same type of noise. Now, what if the attacker injects too much noise? Would this make those nodes or hosts more malicious? So we define the cost of the attack as anomaly cost. That is the no degree percentile change in U. To explain that in detail, let's look at the cumulative distribution of a uh, number of distinct NX domains here by, uh, by all hosts in a day. On 95th percentile, it lies here. Only 5% of the hosts curate more than 10 distinct NX domains in a day. Now, if infected hosts increase the number of NX domains it curates from 2 to 10, that increases the host suspiciousness because the percentile change from 48th to 95th. However, our experiments show that injecting noise has surprisingly low anomaly cost. Only 9% 9 9 of infected hosts increase their percentile substantially and the remaining 90% almost didn't change. This is because even before the attack, um, in fact, the hosts are curing more domains than usual. Therefore, they were already at 99th percentile. Our second attack is small community attack. It exploits the small community problem that has been discussed um, widely by related work. Small communities ex exist in all kinds of different graphs and social networks. And it's known to uh, cause a problem for spectral methods. In order to create small community, attacker starts from the local graph again. Now, the attacker does an extra step to create a complete version of the bipartite graph first. And then she removes nodes and edges from that complete version. In this specific example, the attacker chooses to keep three nodes from V, and uh, that gives the V prime, and then one edge per remaining node from V prime. This can be done in the case such as a server-side DGA for a DGA detection system. The resulting G prime consisting of a U prime, V prime, E prime is the graph after the attack. This is just one configuration of the attack. Um, it consists of the attacker's choice of Y nodes to remove from V and X edges to uh, Y nodes to keep from V and X edges to keep per remaining node. In our experiment, we will test different attack configurations with creating small communities and see what is the actual attack success rate. This incurs a agility cost. We define the agility cost as decrease in the attacker graph density. Because by losing nodes and edges, the attacker first loses redundancy. In the case of DGA domains, it makes the botnet easier to be sinkhole. And also, in some other types of security graph, this may mean the attacker will lose behavior of malware or any malicious activity. Therefore, the attacker also loses utility. We experiment with different attack configurations to create small communities. Um, so this experiment is from a sample box malware family. That originally, it has 618 domain names for this community and shared by 11 infected hosts. On the y-axis, we tested with different um, 
random number of DJ that means you keep from the community. And on the accesses, we test it with how many number of edges to keep per remaining node. Now each area indicated whether that community is small enough for the system to think uh, the small community can no longer be clustered together. If the tech is successful, then nodes belonging to the support box will be join a Death Star cluster in spectral clustering. Otherwise, the attack fails. Judging from the successful error in this plot, we derive that if the attacker randomly chooses a configuration of creating the small community, the success rate is 75%. That applies to a minimal knowledge attacker without having access to the entire data set. However, as a perfect knowledge attacker, she can guarantee the success by choosing a known successful configuration. Lastly, as modern knowledge attacker, we require that the Stereo network data set should be smaller than the original network data set for this area to be included. Otherwise, the chosen con successful configuration may still fail in the original network data set. So due to the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into too much detail for the no modern knowledge attacker. Uh, we conducted a lot of additional experiments in the paper to show that why there's a requirement of a surrogate network, network data set size. In addition to the problem for spectral clustering, um, small communities are also a problem for no 2 vac because of an undersampling issue. So no 2 vac has the novelty of using nodes neighborhood to generate graph embeddings. In order to explain the undersampling issue, let's look at how it works first. So the nodes neighborhoods are generated as following. If we start from this node H1 to do a random walk of length six, we might go through these nodes. And this gives us a random walk sample with length six. Now within this sample, if there's a neighborhood size hyperparameter set to three, then every four consecutive nodes constructs a neighborhood observation. These will be a neighborhood observation of three nodes for the first node. After doing a lot of random walks with different hyperparameter settings, Node2Vac learns embeddings to maximize this conditional probability of seeing nodes in neighborhoods given the nodes. The way it learns embedding is, close, is similar to what Word2Vac does. Based on the original paper, uh, the evaluation shows that Node2Vac outperforms spectral clustering and also outperforms other graph embedding techniques that utilize random walks such as deep work and line. Now, no bank is already better at handling small community. However, there's still the issue of some undersampling. If we think about an island of just one host curing one domain, no matter how, man how many times we try to do the random walk and how much further we want to work out, this is only going to walk back and forth. And the neighborhood observation would just be uh, the neighborhood of the host will be the domain, and the neighborhood of the domain will be the host. Therefore, nodes in small communities will likely be undersampled. In comparison, those nodes in bigger, larger, denser communities will often have multiple neighborhood observations, and they appear in different neighborhoods more often. So our results uh, were from the same uh, set of different attack configurations in the small uh, community attack for the support box malware family. We noticed that this looks a little differently in node 2 back than spectral clustering. First, no matter how many times we run, we notice that the first column and the bottom two rows are always, almost always successful. So this indicates the smallest communities where, for example, the first column says um, every DG domain is just cured by one distinct host and no, infected, uh, no two infected hosts share the same DG domain. And the bottom two rows indicate that um, there are fewer, for, uh, there are less than fewer uh, 40 DGA domains. In the remaining part of the plot, there are a lot of randomness. This is due to the fact that neighborhood sampling is random in no 2 vac If this sampling are good, then uh, the small community attack fails. If we're unlucky and neighborhoods do not represent, um, are not represented well by the sampling, then the small community attack succe succeed. Because of the randomness, we conclude that no 2 vac has fewer guarantees for a small community attack and incurs a higher cost than spectral clustering. To look at the cost in the details of a, our 
uh, density cost de definition. We conducted those cost experiments to see what is the minimum graph density decrease in different parameters uh, compar in comparison between special clustering and no 2 vac Now, when we chose hyperparameter um, in the traditional way in spectral clustering, there's no cost. And the cost increases and reaches the maximum when the SVD rank is 200. However, choosing hyperparameters in the traditional way in no 2 vac incurs an even higher cost than special clustering. These results inspired us to propose a defense of tuning hyperparameters in order to increase the cost of small community attack and also reduce the small community attack success rate. Now, how did we choose the special clustering um, parameter to begin with? In textbook, we are told to pick the elbow point of the squeeze plot of eigenvalues, and that gives us 35. However, if we do another squeeze plot of small community attack success rate, the elbow point changes. Now it becomes 100 or 200. So these reduce the small community attack success rate in comparison with the traditional way of choosing the hyperparameter. Similarly, um, we can tune this work length um, hyperparameter in no 2 vac as well. So the, this plot shows that work length 12 has a lower attack success rate than work length 20, so it should be preferred if we care about the robustness of a clustering system. However, we chose 20 to begin with because work length 12 has a lower validity score than 20. Validity scores indicate the accuracy in clustering, and that's the traditional way of choosing the hyperparameters. In this talk, we describe the attacks in a general way. Our experiments were, however, very specific to attacking a DGA detection system. And we proposed two types of costs, anomaly cost and agility cost in case of a no degree change and graph density change. In order to generalize these attacks to different types of security graph, such as binary downloading graph and malware behavioral graph, there are different considerations that uh, exist. For instance, it's trivial for any host to curate or not curate any domain name, such um, that this, it's easy to inject and remove nodes in the host curate domain graph. However, in other types of security graph, the set of injectable and removable nodes vary. Um, in addition, there may be additional costs of manipulating the nodes and address themselves. Uh, for instance, if we think about a spam email case, it's hard for a malware not to do the read system call if it wants to send a spam email. Um, so we need to add additional cost analysis in order to generalize the adversarial analysis. It is also a worthwhile direction to try to bump the cost if we uh, try to generalize these attacks. To summarize the, the talk, we present the first practical adversarial clustering analysis for graph-based modeling techniques. Under our threat model, we propose Target noise injection attack and small community attack. The attacks have surprisingly low cost. Injecting noise do not make hosts become more anomalous uh, in most cases. And also creating small communities do not decrease graph density in spectral clustering if we choose this SV rank in a traditional way. The good news for us is, however, in no 2 vac the cost is higher. We also propose the two defenses um, that first we can re try to retrain the noisy clusters to deal with noisy, uh, to deal with target noise injection attack. And we can try to tune hyperparameters to reduce the small community attack success rate. Now I'd like to thank the audience for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for a very interesting work. Um, I have questions about how you define the attacker success. Uh, it sounds like that you're you're thinking about whether the the attacker is the subgraph is being can it, can the attacker make it into multiple subgraphs or embedding other graphs. So, did you consider uh, let's say one graph, one subgraph become two subgraphs, but those two subgraphs were embedded with some uh, negatives. 
In that case, you have you're introducing some false positive, perhaps, but still those attackers can still be identified. So how do you consider deal with that? And uh, furthermore, is that what motivates you to think about this is the way to measure the attacker success in this clustering graph based clustering kind of work? Um, so to answer the question, in Node2Vec, we have a very strict definition of attack success because of graph embedding will generate very noisy embeddings for uh, small communities. Um, those attacker nodes will join other noisy clusters. Therefore, we enforce every um, resulting cluster containing attacker's nodes must be predicted with the wrong label. Um, I know this may be um, like too strict, but because um, it is possible for um, the defender to detect what are infected hosts, even if a small set of domains can be predicted. Um, this is, it, I think it, it's a worthwhile direction to relax the definition of attack success and see how that affects the results. Because we want all attackers' domains to not be detected or predicted with the correct label. Hi, uh, great job. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, you, um, my name is Arezu, I'm from Organisys. Uh, uh, my question is about this uh, uh, impact of the structure of network on your uh, uh, success rate of your attack. For example, for um, community, uh, the graph with a high community structure, is hard to fool, for example, them to miss for example, uh, to class in uh, uh, falsely, because the, we can, you can see very dense uh, connection in the communities and very sparse connection between two communities. So I would like to know how uh, would uh, your model works uh, when the community structure uh, is so strong. So, um it, just like you said, it's really hard to change uh, and manipulate the nodes and address in many different settings. Um, but I, I would like to clarify that um, by conducting all those adversarial analysis, it doesn't necessarily mean the attackers can do that in reality. It means that um, there's a disconnection between what are the labeled set of data versus what are the unknown data that we want to cluster. So it's very often that the labels are generated from uh, larger, denser communities. Therefore, we tune hyperparameters towards those larger and denser communities. However, there are a lot of things we may miss if uh, the small communities are meaningful data in the network that we want to cluster. Oh, okay, so it means that the, the small communities are uh, more important than the larger ones? Uh, it doesn't mean they're more important, but I think it helps us understand what we are missing. Mm. by choosing uh, the original set of parameters. Mm. And therefore, I think it depends on the application. You can decide what, where you want to tune towards. And your attack is a target-based or uh, not target-based or community-based? Oh, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, hi, Yang Zhang from CISPA Sarla University, Germany. So nice work. So I'm wondering, so, so you use uh, your, your small community attack. You use no to act. So in Node2Vec, you have two parameters. One's basically on a random walk. You control whether you stay stay, uh, stay in your local neighborhood or go to the global. So how do you train that? And uh, what's the implication of, the, of your these two parameters on your attack? Um, so um, to choose the hyperparameters in the beginning, we use traditional way of cluster validity in this, like, like including those six um, indicated here. Um, so for example, for the neighborhood size, we've simply chose the first highest uh, clustering accuracy based on small set of labeled um, domains. Um, it, those, basically, those indices they choose like within the set of labeled domains, should two domains be clustered together and are they clustering together in, in the end? There are four combinations of those and they, they use those formulas to compute the accuracy of clustering. So we basically use those um, validity indices to choose hyperparameters to begin with, and then we conducted the attacks on top of that.